We're getting started. Okay, everyone, welcome to uh, System Thinking Ontario. Um, I am not Zad Khan. Uh, I am David Ng filling in for Zad Khan today, and we're welcoming uh, Peter Tuddenham to talk about uh, co exploring systems literacy. There's a lot to unpack there, and um, I think that actually for most of the most of the time we have, we're going to have a, a conversation uh, with Peter more than him uh, talking with us because a lot of co exploring is about learning together. Mm -hmm. And so um, if uh, we could come off spotlight mode, we actually should go around oh. and uh, with everyone and okay. just uh, have a brief introduction and see who's actually on. So. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, people can uh, mind their mutes on and off, and uh, I'll go around and call people out when I see them on the screen, which on mine is a little difficult because now I'm on the second screen. <laughs> um, anyway, um, and we'll go around introductions. Um, so let's see, who do we have on? Uh, Josh, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thanks. Um, so I've been coming to um, meetings, um, you know, once every four months or something, I think is my pattern and, and, uh, enjoying them a great deal. Um, and, uh, hoping to, I'm, I'm starting to get in the door of doing some, uh, research on, um, social enterprise design, um, just to support new social enterprises. And, and so I, I found out about this um, group through uh, in Toronto um, Center for Social Innovation. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Kelly, say hi. Hey, hi, I'm Kelly Okamura. I'm uh, Toronto based as well. Um, I come to systems through uh, uh, design thinking and 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 Peter Jones um, and I have uh, been working more recently with uh, David and crew in terms of uh, systems changes. Welcome, Thanks, Peter. Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Elena. Uh, hi, I'm Elena Leonard. I'm also in Toronto. I've been involved in this group since its beginning and involved in systems for even longer and. I'm very happy it's turning into spring. Thanks. Eva. Hi, my name's Eva. I'm a designer. Um, I'm currently learning about system at, uh, at OCAD, taught by Peter. <laughs> uh, yeah, nice to be here. Thanks. Dean. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Dean. Uh, relative, I, I, this is my second of these meetings. So I'm going to try and make more of them in the future. Relatively new to Toronto, uh, former physicist, current energy and environment regulator, and uh, interested in following the conversation and showing up to more of these meetings. So thanks. Great. Thanks. Robert. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, show, let, let's see your son. We, I haven't actually seen your son yet. Bring him into the photo too. <laughs> I'm calling from the Mark area, so near Toronto. And I, I don't know, I still don't have a good description of how I came to systems, but uh, I'd say through curiosity and self-directed learning. And I met David uh, a couple of years ago at a DWeb P2P conference. And that's sort of how I took a slightly deeper dive and uh, wound up attending some of these. Uh, systems in the Ontario calls and yeah I was generally curious and excited excited to be here thanks, thanks. and I might be off camera I sort of uh, would be back and forth but listening good okay is that uh, Elena I can't read the small font here I already Please. went no E L E oh that one yes E L E N A, or is that I can't see that? Sorry. Yeah, that's correct. Elena, do you want to say hello? She was trying to fix her uh, phone or something, I think, the last time. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, Daisy, say hi. 
Hi everyone. Um, I'm also based in Toronto. Uh, I I was visiting uh, one of the times uh, when uh, Peter and um, his students were doing synthesis mapping, and I just really enjoyed the subject matter. And just great to be here with everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Hello. This is Joanne. I'm I'm sorry. I'm not on video. I'm in the kitchen, <laughs> trying to fix dinner, eating dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm usually on video and I've met um, most of the people here. So I'm a, a business systems architect um, and uh, a practitioner of uh, complexity thinking and systems thinking. Uh, what I mean by that is I uh, speak about it and I've introduced it to two major clients and made uh, proposals and so, uh, solution proposals to both. Um, so recently I've I've been trying to uh, integrate uh, complexity thinking and systems thinking with design principles and to find a way to um, uh, bridge the high level um, talking points often we hear and um, uh, the much lower level designers just implementing solutions without being able to uh, uh, considering uh, the the system as a whole, so uh, <laughs> that's a long winded uh, introduction. So I'm looking forward to this session. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jessica. Hi everyone. I'm I'm also from Toronto. Uh, this is my first Systems Thinking Ontario meeting, so I'm I'm very excited to join, and uh, I'm very new to this field. Just curious, interested to uh, listen and to learn more. So thank you for hosting. Okay, uh, Bev. Hello, Bev. Want to say hi? Yes. Hello. Yes. Sorry. Um, let me find my video. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, hi. Hello. I am actually out of uh, California, but come to you through uh, Peter Jones, and um, he is my uh, professor at the moment at OCAD University, where I'm studying design for health, um, and um, this is my first foray into systems. And unfortunately, I have another meeting um, in 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm very brief on this visit with you now, but I look forward to uh, hopefully joining you many more times in the future. Thanks, Bev. So we'll be recording, but I'm way behind on still getting January's recording out. So uh, eventually <laughs> they'll show up. Okay. Mick, say hi. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Mick. I'm from uh, from Toronto as well. Um, been meaning to come to these to come to one of these for a little over two years now. Um, this is my first one, uh, so finally made it. Um, I came to systems through uh, a master's program uh, in engineering for sustainable development, uh, which I wrapped up uh, in September 2020. Um, it was an interesting uh, an interesting year. Um, but yeah, excited to, uh, to finally uh, get to see what goes on in one of these meetings. Thanks. Peter Jones, say hi. Uh, I'll say hi. I'll be brief. Uh, I, I teach systemic design at OCAD and master's programs, as, as a couple of people have mentioned. And we have about, geez, 70 students across all, all the programs uh, in the middle of, of uh some intensive um, system modeling and doing research into complex contexts for design applications using systemic design toolkit, synthesis maps. So yeah, it's it, it's a fun term. Thanks, Peter. Yep. Uh, Dan, you should introduce yourself. Okay, Dan Ng here. Um, come, I'm from Toronto. I come to systems uh, thinking from basically uh, sitting in a room with David way back in my MBA days. He'd tell me st stuff about it. I didn't understand anything. So, you know, fast forward, whatever, 20 some odd years later, I still don't understand it, but I understand more. So great to have you guys here. Great. And so, um, it, so now I'll introduce uh, Peter Tuddenham. 
Uh, Peter is a former president of the International Society for the System Sciences. Um, he's been involved in a long-term program called the College of Exploration. Uh, for those of you who don't get enough of systems thinking, I want to drop in on um, the ISSS members. Uh, Peter has uh, been running a program for a long time, but recently has been moving it uh, more open in the College of Exploration so that the first Friday of the month, people can come um, in Eastern time, it's between four and six, I think, on three and six. Um, and, um, and you get to hang out with people all around the world that are actually uh, who you would meet at an ISSS meeting if you actually had the opportunity to travel. Um, so uh, I met Peter. It's, it's always interesting being in the ISSS because you meet people, you can never tell what they're doing. Peter was always the one, who, I would go in the front with the little camera, he would be in the back with the big camera. And so, so he has this long history of recordings. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about systems literacy. Peter? Well, thank you. And um, thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Uh, maybe I can share my screen because uh, I did do a bit of PowerPointing uh, possibility here. So, um, let me just uh, eek. That's uh, that's tricky. I can't see where you do the screen share because it's buried. Oh, where am I down here? There we go. Okay, so yeah, so thank you very much, David, for the invitation. It got me to. and Zoom quit unexpectedly. We can hear you, Peter. Oh. Oh, Zoom is telling me it's quitting unexpectedly. I don't know why that is. Um, well, we still see your screen and I have your face in the corner. So is it going to quit on us? Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, that's something that hasn't happened before. Losing your main speaker. Yeah. yeah you starts. Oh, I'm back I'm back again, I think. Oh, oh there he is. I'm back again. Uh, yes, I have no idea why that is. That's never happened to me. Of course, it would happen when I'm making a presentation. So I don't know why that is. So let me share this again. Let's just do this. We'll try again. So you can hear me. I'm back. Yeah, and we've got your screen. Okay, let's hope it stays um, stable. So just briefly, my systems journey. I got introduced to the, the idea of, of general systems theory uh, when taking a course in 1978 from the Open University uh, on industrial relations. And they said, before you can do that, you've got to learn about general systems theory. And then through the years, I've had a number of different experiences um, studying systems behavior with the Open University, which was a fantastic course uh, back in 1979. Uh, when I came to the United States in 1980, started thinking about what to do systems wise. And I spent a couple of years working with Baylor Banathy on systems design at Saybrook. Um, I had some time in Arizona where I was uh, part of the Arizona State University Center for Ethics and I got to use soft system methodology to look at uh, telephone deregulation. Uh, then I moved to Washington DC um, area here and I became a consultant with a Beltway company, had a research project with the Army Research Institute looking at uh, what it takes to be a leader in the US Army and got to um, uh, teach at the US Army War College as part of a guest faculty uh, time there. And it was all about systems leadership and developing uh, the, the cognitive and emotional skills necessary to deal with, well, the US Army at that point had just you know, declared that VUCA, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity is important. 91 started the College of Exploration, as David said. Um, got involved in literacies, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then started the Systems Literacy Initiative in 2008, 
Um, I'm also a trustee of the American Society of Cybernetics and David just said that I was president of IFSS. So I was just going to say this term systems literacy actually has been around for a while, uh, interestingly. And in 1992, somebody called Fred Crowell uh, introduced the idea as a design concept um, and published a paper. And uh, he, he really was looking at a very high level about education in general um, and, and called systems literacy would seem to indicate the capability of knowing and communicating about ways of looking at world, that is how the world works. Um, and then he went on to talk about systems illiteracy, which is perpetuated since cognitive structures are reproduced, which recognize only one way of looking at the world, which he called the mechanistic way. And we certainly think about that. Um, I'm not going to go through this too much, but he really looked at an ability to, to think in different metaphors about the way that we educate and we design learning and so on. Um, and he really ended up with the, that he felt that um, organ, organic, organicism was uh, probably a, a, a best way of looking at systems literacy, um, which is taking into account the whole system um, and has a sort of synthetic integrative uh, uh, approach. Um, and, and is, I, what was interesting to me about his ideas was he was looking at this idea of contradiction and paradox and so on, which sort of fitted to some extent with what we were talking about at the Army War College, which was how to live with volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, which is being able to really have a, a, an emotional comfort with, um, well, these, these topics, ambiguity, um, paradox and so on. Um, he, his view was that you know one should be taking an account of all of these uh, all of these metaphors as you think about uh, um, educating and designing education systems. And we could talk about the design of education systems. I'm sure that you know I know that in in uh, OCAD there you you talk about these things. So um, he interestingly I just pulled this out because I thought it was interesting in in how he thought about moving from a systems illiterate to systems literacy, um, a concerted effort. And he said, with the International Society for System Sciences at the forefront to convince key decision makers of business, government, education leaders that systems literacy is vital concern to our people, our society and our planetary environment. So, you know, this was back in, in, the, in the 90s. Um, and he, he came up with a number of elements or characteristics which he thought would be uh, important. And this is something we've been talking about is how do you start thinking about educating uh, students about systems from kindergarten through graduate schools. Um, he was suggesting that there should be some design resource centers, which I think is a good idea, obviously, on system topics and to stimulate sy systemic activities. Um, going on to talk about art and uh, multiple perspectives and how to develop that. And back in the 90s, before we all had mobile phones, obviously networks to promote systems literacy uh, and collaborative research. So uh, global, and we're of course beginning to experience some of that um, and teacher training programs as well in systems. So these are all still needs, all of these things um, still very much uh, um, not happening very much at all. He, um, he referred to a poem from Robinson Jeffers, which I thought was rather uh, good. And I, th I, th I thought it'd be good to bring in a bit of poetry into this idea of systems literacy. Um, to know this and know however ugly the parts appear, the whole remains beautiful. A severed hand is an ugly thing and a man dissevered from the earth and stars and his history for contemplation or in fact often appears atrociously ugly. Integrity is wholeness. The greatest beauty is organic wholeness, the wholeness of life and things, the divine beauty of the universe. Love that, not man apart from that, or else you will share man's pitiful confusion or drown in despair when his di days darken. I, 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 it's the first time I've read that uh, or presented it. Um, I, I think it it's, it's gives us something to think about. So another um, piece of systems literacy that um, kind of came before I started talking about it was PBS, uh, the Public Broadcasting 
service here in the United States, and they have a whole website on systems literacy. But what they're really talking about systems literacy is um, it's a set of teacher guides through the basics of systems thinking, which you know is good probably for for you guys in Ontario thinking about systems thinking. And, and shows how you integrate systems literacy across the grades and across disciplines. But then, of course, it's their, their definition of systems literacy, which has a preponderance, as you might see from the title here, of systems dynamics and causal loops. And um, so that's where their emphasis is. And that's just one aspect of systems. But I did want to notice that they, they brought that out. And it's there, you know, it's an interesting piece of um, a, a interesting website, which you can go to. So I wanted to talk about ocean literacy a little bit, because that's what led me on to this systems literacy um, uh, work um, that I, I was doing. In, in the 2000, uh, 2004, worked on ocean literacy and came up with seven principles for ocean literacy. And I'm starting to look at how that might translate into uh, a possibility of system or systems literacy. Um, the ocean literacy principles are the earth has one big ocean with many features. If you think about it, um, most uh, students are taught there are many oceans, Pacific, Atlantic, Southern, uh, and so on, and Indian. And as a consequence, there is the possibility that there is a misconception that the oceans are separate rather than being one whole. Uh, so that's another interesting idea, I think, as well. Um, I don't think I'm going to go through those in any more detail because I'll come back to it. But it's, there's a sort of magic number seven. And um, here are some ideas of what systems literacy might contain. So this has been an unfolding story for me from when we started doing literacy guides. We did one with the National Geographic um, on putting ocean topics into geography which then led to this one on ocean literacy, which I was just referring to, which then led to doing one on earth science literacy, which then led to one on climate literacy and Great Lakes literacy. And uh, also then energy folks got together and they, want, they did one on energy literacy as a part of that. Atmospheric literacy as well was another one that's been done. And there's several others, network literacy and so on. So it's a, there's a whole list of literacies uh, on our website. So I got a bit, I was thinking, well, wait a minute, guys, you know, we've done all of these different literacies. It's really about systems. And so in 2008, um, we really started talking about systems literacy as a combination of earth, ocean, um, biological, ecological, physical, chemical, social systems ideas um, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that we could perhaps bring to schools and to education. So it's very much based on a based in nature, if I can put it that way, or based in uh, um, natural sciences um, uh, foundation. I'm very keen on that. And I, I think that's a, a very important, um, a very important part of what this should be about. The other part that's interesting is this, um, in the United States, um, the states were not happy with the science standards. And so there was a grassroots effort to, to um, recreate science standards in the United States. And they're called the Next Generation Science Standards. And they consist of three uh, areas. You can see the green, the orange, and the blue. Uh, the disciplinary core ideas is the, the, um, the, the heart of it, if you will, in some respects. And then there's um, engineering uh, principles and practices uh, is the other part. And the third part is this, what they're calling cross-cutting concepts. And we've been focusing on these because they have a, the language has some system-ish kind of feel to it. Even though they're one through seven here, they're not really um, in um, any kind of hierarchical order per se, although you might presume that from the way that they are written. Um, but uh, I'm working with some of the authors of these to begin to provide some support for system and system models as a beginning point, for example, and then to build out on patterns. And I mean, I don't necessarily like cause and effect and mechanism. I mean, that, you know, if you, if you, if you start thinking about just mechanisms, 
then you're not necessarily thinking in systems, may, maybe or maybe not. We can have a, a chat about all of this um, when, once I've just gone through this sort of prompting uh, set. But there is, there's seven there. And I think, you know, the systems community writ large should, um, we should work on, on helping at least educators in the United States um, um, to, to develop that. Um, so what's happened within the community here? Well, um, in 2015, I went to Berlin to the International Society for System Sciences, and that's when I opened my mouth and said to the community, I think we should do systems literacy. I didn't know anything about the previous uh, work that had been done. And um, we had a conversation in Austria uh, with the International Federation for Systems Research. And since then, um, I've been talking with uh, systems engineers at INCOSI, um, my colleagues and friends at the American Society for Cybernetics, um, and we've done um, a number of different uh, pieces of work, um, which is that slide uh, there. Then in 2019, um, I was president of the IFSS, and we had a conference in Corvallis at Oregon State University, where the focus was nature's enduring patterns as a path to systems literacy. Um, and I brought my friends uh, who had worked on these literacies together um, at that meeting. And the presentations are all online if you have any interest in, in those topics. Um, so, uh, it, you know, I'm trying to bring some holistic appreciation to this, um, to this group of, uh, of topics, essentially. Um, I wanted to just also turn to um, Nora Bateson, who um, gave a presentation while she spoke at, in Berlin, actually, at the meeting that I went to as well. And she introduced this term, which I really like, and I thought we could have a conversation too about some of this. She's introduced this word symathesy, um, which is a new word for systems that emerge from communications and interactions. Um, and she's really putting forward the idea that we, we learn together, essentially, from two Greek words. Um, and and the, to understand how we learn together and be together is, is a, an ideal, I suppose, she might say. Um, and she published that in, in uh, the journals from the IFSS and also in a book that she wrote in about three years ago or so called Small Arcs of Larger Circles, which I recommend to you. Um, so those are sort of some, that's a, a rather quick rush through, but I wanted to sort of just set some, some topics for conversation uh, up here. Um, we had hoped that Zad would be here because I had a chat with David and Zad um, a couple of weeks ago and, and we were going to have a sort of a prompted uh, conversation from Zad took lots of notes, but anyway, that's me um, and um, I'm, that was sort of more of a provocative prompt of some of the things that have been going on uh, to, to kind of create a conversation really um, amongst everybody that's here. Um, so that's, that's my whiz through of a piece of the systems literacy work that we're doing. And, and now that I'm finished being president of IFSS, um, I'm hoping to you know, continue to build on this initiative and actually get maybe something more definitive out there that's beyond the website and make more influence on the on the school systems here in the United States and possibly um, around the world, um, like we've done with ocean literacy. So that's sort of a really brief kind of rush through. It's already, you know, we're already 45 minutes into the session or nearly 40 minutes. So um, I'm, I would, you know, love a conversation now on, on systems literacy in your world, what, what do you think it should be, how, how high level should we be talking, should we, you know, how can, how can we take taking on educational systems around the world, um, on the one hand, and at the other hand, working at the level of classrooms or, or schools or, or whatever. Um, so uh, lots of questions, even the term systems literacy is a difficult one in Spanish, they don't have an equivalent, so it has some, it has some problems. But anyway, that's sort of where I am at the moment. Um, and I hope we can, can co-explore it now, giving you a little bit of a context. 
I don't know what's the first question. Um, how long do you normally go for, David, on these? Is this, did, did you? Um, we run. Uh, we could run to eight fifteen. Um, okay. So we have, a, we have an hour. We have lots of time. We run longer. Okay. We run shorter. So. Okay. Well, that's cool. Uh, so well, if you, if people have questions or comments, if you could just pop them in uh, to the uh, into the chat or just put your hand up or something, so I can keep a cue. Um, so um, I see, is that Mick? Does that Mick actually have a hand up that you're trying to, that you want to ask a question? I do, yeah. Um, and thanks, Peter, for the presentation. It was really fascinating. And you touched on it right at the end is a perfect segue into my question about how it's hard in Spanish to translate uh, systems literacy. Um, I'm reading Robin Wall Kimmerer's um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is about indigenous knowledge uh, and how it intersects with scientific knowledge. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I just finished reading a chapter called The Grammar of Animacy, which seems it, it seems to dovetail really nicely with what we've been talking about. It talks about um, indigenous languages, and this is a sweeping generalization, but how compared to sort of Western European languages, um, they're, they're very verb focused, uh, whereas Western European languages are very noun focused, um, tend to reduce things into their constituent elements and um, kind of makes sense with how with the culture uh, in which these languages evolved. Um, but I, I, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on how much of uh, when we're talking about building systems literacy, um, how much are we in a, in a battle against the, the very language that we communicate in? Well, it's interesting you bring that up um, because back in Austria, when we were in that conversation, and it was a week long conversation on systems literacy, Ray Eisen, who's a colleague, um, and a professor at the Open University leading their systems uh, work now challenged me. He said, well, that's all very well, but um, if you're truly going to be systems literate uh, in multiple ways and multiple languages, then we need to find ways to express what that means in much more than the English language, um, but also in symbols. And I, in fact, did a paper with Helen Tinadori on pattern literacy as a path to systems literacy, where we identified a number of different um, iconic uh, representations of different systems attributes. And um, it's been a very real challenge. Uh, um, I've talked to, and in fact, of systemsliteracy.org, I have both a um, Shankar Sankarin who talked about it in um, one of the Indian languages, and also another colleague uh, talking about uh, what systems literacy might mean in Chinese. Um, and to be truly holistic, you know, we need to be very conscious that we construct our, I mean, I'm constructing this conversation in English language from my cultural experience of growing up in London and learning the English language there, tempered by 40 years of American English and cultural experience. Um, and it's a very real dilemma, uh, quite honestly. And it's one reason that this is taking much longer than I ever anticipated when I opened my mouth to suggest we do something because my experience with the ocean literacy work was that it was fairly straightforward. Um, it, was, it was predicated on a, a desire by educators who were frustrated that nobody learned about the ocean in school uh, at all. So there's a complete lack of any awareness about the marine environment which is so important in all of our lives. I mean, providing oxygen and food and transportation and, and everything else and a big heat sink and it's connected to climate change. So um, that's how we came up with ocean literacy. Um, but when you talk about systems literacy, how to find a, a way to express it that's not just in the English language or, I mean, even, I mean, you know, I'm sure, Canadian English is not the same as American English. It's pretty close, but it's different. And English English is different. And English in different parts of England is different um, because there's all kinds of different cultural uh, contexts. And so how to find an expression for it is really challenging, quite honestly. And that's why this is a co-exploration because I certainly don't have the answers to that question. I mean, the other thing I would say about um, indigenous knowledge um, in particular is that um, I'm very conscious of that, <laughs> and um, that too is another, in fact, just before we started, I was talking with Dan about the Algonquian um, uh, park or forest or whatever that's near there in Toronto, and we have Algonquian here, 
and um, I've had some conversations with traditional ecological knowledge folks, um, and I, I want more because I think there's a lot to offer there. Um, and um, you know, it would be really it would be really helpful to put in. What I will say about the term literacy, ocean literacy. Um, because of the way we went about that project is now a global phenomenon. It's got picked up by the UN based on some prompting from us. And the way that we regard the words ocean literacy, which are not translatable into Spanish, for example, or Portuguese, um, is it's iconic. And it really means an expression of our relationship with the sea or the ocean. I mean, even I grew up with the sea, not the ocean. Uh, there's a whole other piece of mental construction that I had to come to terms with. So uh, very conscious of that, don't have the answers particularly, except to say that, you know, I, I've experienced ocean literacy becoming a global phenomena because of the way we use the imagery of the ocean um, as a precursor to the expression. Um, and please put the link to the book in the chat. I, I will, and I, I just wanna close on one thought. You speaking about ocean literacy, so the Potawatomi language is the one that they're talking about in this chapter. They would, in that language, they would refer to the ocean using a verb, they wouldn't use a noun. And I found that really resonated with how living things are defined by processes right. that are constantly in flux. So there are very, I think, uh, I think she says there are only nine speakers of this language left alive, fluent speakers, um, but they would be inherently uh, systems literate, just by virtue of the language they speak. So, um, just an interesting. Uh, an I, think, interesting I think it's lovely. You know, we need to pick up on it more and see how we can support that idea in in what we're talking about. And I will say that Ocean Literacy Canada is doing some great work with um, uh, Indigenous First Nations, Indigenous peoples, traditional ecological knowledge. They have a full time Ocean Literacy coordinator. Uh, I think at Waterloo um, and. Um, doing a lot to integrate traditional ecological knowledge into ocean literacy or with ocean literacy or reform it. So um, look to Canada for that, which is really great. Thanks. Peter Jones. Uh, Peter Jones, you're up next. Okay. Uh, I'll just add that the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, the, uh, yes. that are yeah. the, the, the major um, you know, rights holders and, and uh, First Nation in, in the Southern Ontario area, well, Kind of with Six Nations, um, their language is verb-based too. So things that we would normally have, I mean, it's probably common in quite a few First Nations languages, but you'd have to actually explore that with the languages. It seems to be, you know, with uh, the, the, the woodland um, areas here that, you know, that, that there are, um, that they are verb based that and then to translate to the kind of objects that we describe requires things like like a, a film is the is the light um is light shining as it falls and things like that you know they, it's very colorful in that description but there are um there are others uh one of the ways i i, I bet you david ing is sitting there going you know, <clears throat> uh, we always have this debate and when he would come into our class, he would always start this debate, Peter, on um, that would kind of get to get it going saying, which came first, structure or process? Mm. You know, or which is more pr prompt, you know, once students are starting to really get these kind of basic distinctions and okay, let's really look into that. What came first or which is, which is more, which is preeminent? And so verb nouns may be a process that becomes sedimented in the way that structures are sedimented processes and over time a building is a process and so Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, um, so this is, uh, so I did have a question for you though, that was uh, with respect to kind of, as you've been continuing to work with you know, uh, literacy programs and, and, um, and promoting this, you know, systems literacy and talking to more people, what are you seeing? as the, the trend in, in non-design education for new systems programs in, in universities and uh, you know, graduate and undergraduate education primarily, and if you're seeing it in high school at all, but just mostly what are the trends that you're seeing now that are leading in, in universities? Because 
I, I am seeing a lot more interest opening up. For those of us who have been in the systems field since like the 90s, it's like, oh, it's come back and gone away a few times, but it seems like there's a real surge of interest. And so I'm just wondering what type of um, new programs you're seeing or what some of the schools are, what, what kind of novel approaches you might be seeing. Well, that's a good that's a good question. I think there's there's a number of different aspects to that. The the there's many programs that are called system sciences that have been diminishing, but there's many other programs that are coming uh, to the fore under different names, right? That aren't necessarily called systems or systems literacy, and it could be complexity science or even like in, in your work, you know, in, in design. So these ideas are coming up in, in new ways uh, with new, new words and to some extent, and some, I think very often it's treated as if it's new <laughs> and, the, and the, the historical evolution and development of the field is uh, missing uh, in, in so many ways. And a lot of times I'm finding that things are rediscovered perhaps. Um, so I can't point to any uh, specific um, programs that um, I would say are about systems literacy per se, but uh, many topics that one could perhaps put a systems literacy label on are there. I spend a lot of time with systems engineers who, I mean, there's a this organization in COSI, the International Council of Systems Engineers has about 19,000 members around the world. And there's a system sciences working group that I've been participating in, and we've run systems literacy uh, work there. And another colleague, Gary Smith, who's based in the UK, and he's VP of systems practice for the International Society for System Sciences, has been making some efforts to pull together a number of threads to support systems engineers who feel, I think, to some extent that there isn't a um, a strong foundation for systems engineering in, in systems um, education. So that's, uh, that's another pull uh, in what we're doing. And uh, Gary just recently gave a presentation to the IFSS on some of the work he's been doing to pull together a number of the system strands and models um, in, in an attempt to bring more integrative ideas to system science. So, um, you know, we, we ourselves are sort of attempting to, to move that along uh, within IS. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's about complexity, isn't it? Complex systems um, is where a lot of energy is, um, is uh, a network science as well. So those, those terms and those programs are, are becoming more and more popular. We have more questions, we can uh, queue them up. Um, I'm gonna bring up something that, that, I, that uh, the first one I put up was, uh, Peter, you had some experience teaching system leadership. Uh, yes. Can you speak a little bit to, to that? Absolutely. Um, so where to start with that one? Um, this was a five-year effort to examine what it took to be a three and four-star general. And it was about around the time just before the Berlin Wall came down. And it was prompted by Colin Powell, who was the, I think he was at the time, he was a chief of staff of the, of the army. Um, and they were concerned, I think is probably the right word, that the world was moving into a very different state um, and that leadership needed to be much more concerned with networked operations. I mean, this was back in the 90s here, now we're talking about, um, well, late, late 80s actually, and early, well, yeah, late 80s, around 1990. So I can't believe it, but it's 30 years ago. It sounds um, quite horrendous how time flies, but the the basis of the work that we did was on Buckminster Fuller's, well, one of the threads was Buckminster Fuller's work in design at Southern Illinois University. And their 
um, while he was there, he ran obviously courses on his work. Um, and one of his uh, students was a gentleman by the name of Richard Archer, who was a professor at Southern Illinois University. And he ran a course on design and creativity, which one of the psychologists at um, the US Army Research Institute had experience of. And so he and I went up to Southern Illinois University and um, spoke to Richard Archer about his approach to creativity and developing creativity and uh, design approaches and so on, and picked up a number of different ways that he was doing that. So that was one thread. And then the other was a thread on emotional and cognitive development. And we studied a lot of the work of um, emotional well, psychologists who are looking at emotional maturities um, and, and development, Keegan in particular um, out of Harvard, and also um, from a organizational and managerial leadership perspective, the work of Elliot Jacks, who uh, of course was in Toronto as well um, um, for many years, lived in, in, uh, in Canada. Um, and the, and the organization that's um, focused on his work is based in Toronto, their requisite organization. Um, so that was another piece of this puzzle was the, the how you develop or how individuals um, come to be aware of their own emotional and cognitive capabilities, if you will, uh, both individually and collectively and how they use that to solve problems. So, uh, or how to deal with complex issues uh, on a global scale. Um, and so we ran two or three, uh, th over two or three years, we ran a, um, was it a 10 or 15 session course on what we called creative problem solving, which took the students through a number of individual and group exercises that got them to start to look for connections in ways that they hadn't looked at before and to look at relationships um, between their cognitive and emotional and verbal um, uh, personality, uh, their position, their, their strengths, their weaknesses. Um, we use the Myers-Briggs uh, in indicator as well uh, as another factor in determining a preferred approach. Um, and so it was very much about, again, uh, actually creating an environment where there was a co-exploration in a safe way um, to, to explore how they dealt with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It wasn't teaching them about, it wasn't teaching them about what that was. It was about simulating it in, in a non-threatening way to challenge their way of thinking and to get them to, to not only dig deeper from a cognitive point of view into, into the in, into how they constructed the, the, the problem situation they were dealing with, but also then how they reacted on an emotional um, uh, level or in, in emotional ways or in, in, in ways that might reflect their preferred uh, way of viewing the world as described in Myers-Briggs, for example. So, um, and that was coupled with traditional talk about what a system is and systems at different levels and what they mean at different levels. And that's something, different levels of complexity, systems at different levels of complexity, I suppose, within an organizational context like Department of Defense um, and the changes that were going on. So that was, that was the experience um, of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to talk with Elliot Jacks a few times and we, we worked on on that program and 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 we had some fun and you know for the folks that took the course they were very grateful many of them said you know they're there for a year um these are these are soldiers and civilians between the ages of 35 and maybe 50 um equivalent to lieutenant colonels um or in the u.s civil service gs 15s 13 14 15s who had been perhaps uh, we're on a faster trajectory to senior leadership and um, organizational position. So, um, and many of them said, you know, this was the best course they took for the year that they were there uh, doing this, uh, 
training essentially or learning and getting a master's degree um, while they were there because we basically challenged the way they thought and why they thought the way they thought um, and um, uh, to encourage them to look for greater connections and greater solution sets if I can put it that way or different ways of thinking about things from getting into the minds of other people and how they might be thinking about them or respecting how people uh, are all different. <laughs> I mean, this may sound silly, but that is, it's, uh, that's, if you've been successful up to your thirties in a direct command environment where you have more direct contact with people, it's a very different situation when you start moving into what we were calling indirect leadership, which is working you know, at a, at a higher level, in the, at least in the DOD, or in a systems level when you're working not only in your particular area like Army, but also Navy, Air Force, Marines, civilian sectors, um, you know, other armies, joint operations, uh, and so on and so forth. Just really um, a very different sort of set of managerial leadership leadership skills, capabilities that are, that are needed. Um, that was, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fascinating period where I learned a lot as well, frankly. Um, but it's really helped, it helped me uh, in a lot of ways understand my journey. Um, and, and I found it to be a useful model to explain complexity uh, using, using the Elliot Jack's approach and Keegan and some of the other folks that we were working with. I don't know, is that, that's my sort of thumbnail sketch of that period in my life, which was quite, quite fascinating, really. It's a lot, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no, it's good. Um, we, have a, we have a comment or question from Elena. Yeah, um, I've been reading Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, about mycelium and how it is everywhere, land, sea, and communicating about a great number of variables. Uh, and they're calling it the wood wide web. Oh, and, yes. And what I'm wondering is, you know, how could we learn to read its language, which is obviously very different from ours, and it, it has decision-making capability, which is also not how we think of making decisions, but, if we could do this, we would have the capability of having real-time measurement of many of the variables that are necessary for survival. And I'm just wondering if, if that would, could be part of a communications literacy package. I think it would be lovely. I mean, there's another book called Mycelum Running, which has some similar ideas about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, as you remember, Elena, I talked about having feeling like I was communicating with the trees up in Alaska yeah. back in the 90s. So, I mean, I'm very much aware that there are energies in trees and they evoke a certain response in a human. And I had a response to some experience that went on there. Um, and uh, I think absolutely, uh, if we could, if we could somehow be more present or more conscious and tune ourselves in um, better or relax more or get into nature more, uh, you know, and, and find ways to bring that expression forward in communication, I think would be absolutely uh, uh, wonderful. Um, so yeah, please put the chat, put the reference in the chat again, um, if you didn't already. I, I put the, uh, I put the book in the chat. Okay, thanks. Lovely. Yeah, because I mean, that would be, you know, nature talking, right, would be, um, I mean, a lot of people are saying that nature is talking in all kinds of ways at the moment. So, um, yeah, thank you. I agree. Has Peter got his hand up from before or has it not come down? I think Peter's hand has not come down. Okay. <laughs> He's a keener. He always has his hand up. <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, I'm, so I, I'm looking at the notes that Zad had been taking, and he was going to ask the question about wisdom. Um, how does literacy fit in with wisdom? Oh, yeah, that was an interesting one, wasn't it? I mean, I didn't, I didn't have an answer to that, but 
um, we were going to talk about what wisdom is and isn't and how does it relate to systems literacy i mean wisdom is a and it is uh, well i suppose a lot of people say that wisdom i mean comes with age <laughs> i mean that's one may not um yeah. Well, yeah. One, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I was reminded of as I was looking back on, on my journey through the system sciences is that uh, I didn't actually start looking at the systems until I was 40 years old. Really? Um, yeah, because yeah. there was an opportunity at IBM and I was working on a project and all of a sudden I was doing a lot of ACOF and looking and going from there. And so the systems literacy work that you've been uh, targeting appears to be below age 40 let's put it that way but the system leadership stuff you're talking about is like above age 40 or you know close correct to it. and yes. and so there's kind of like a i um is there a continuum or an arc or how do you think about a trajectory on on this as we're co as we're co-exploring well you know um <sighs> this is a very interesting area to consider um and i don't have an answer except to say that my my uh learning about elliot jacks's models of cognitive expression if you will or a way of speaking um about a topic uh as a representation of how you're thinking about it which may or may not be a valid um concept although he would say it was um you, you, you may you may have to back up and do a little bit of elliot jack's uh, education for people who are not familiar yeah, that, with him. that's true sorry uh, well elliot jack's that in a brief way um was a um psychologist and a doctor and then a psychiatrist and then an organizational analyst and he started looking at the way that organizations um build themselves in the 1950s 60s with a company in England. And interestingly, I picked up a book that was written by a colleague of his when I was in high school uh, called Explorations in Management. And there he talked about a naturally occurring stratification that occurs in organizations um, that's at that time represented by salary levels um, and that people in organizations have different, um, yeah, that's it, well done, I think. Um, and, um, he asserted that individuals have different ways of sharing their experience of life based on different levels of complexity in what they're viewing, if you will. And um, so the, the idea is that, that you're on actually, you, you could possibly be on a trajectory. He called them modes of thought. Uh, at different levels of complexity and he had um, he started with five and he got to six and seven and in the end he had a sort of like an octave notion of of complexity and that individuals are on a developmental curve even um, based on who knows what um, is it a curve you're born with is it a curve that you develop through your education or your experience growing up as a child I think these are areas for research that could be very um, fruitful. We had a hypothesis at the Army War College that you could actually intervene um, at, say, age 35 or to 40 and accelerate. And maybe this is what happened with you, David, is that when you learn more about perspective taking or paradigm shifting or systems ideas that you become you accelerate your your learning and you accelerate your ability to deal with complexity because you've got more more um, cognitive horsepower for want of a better term um, and and so what I've been looking at is how do we how do we introduce these ideas to to students that go beyond perhaps what might call you know like the systems literacy as per the PBS model there, which is sort of largely based on, I think, systems thinking a la Peter Senge and 
systems dynamics, um, but is a, in a, a more holistic way uh, of thinking about it. So it, it is possible that individuals are on a path and they are on the path and they stay on the path that's one way of thinking about it or it might be that there's an opportunity to yeah he does uh, that's right Peter, you're sort of helping me with this um and i i just find it and it's an interesting you know proposition to think about and um can we can we intervene or can you offer opportunities for individuals who wish to you know develop that kind of capability to do so through some form of reflective experiences um and and what what is what is our responsibility in doing that too um it's it's a it's a bit of a dilemma i find um as i get older so um i'm actually going to invite peter jones to join in more actively in in this part because i'm not well, I, i'm not a not. i'm not a i'm not a um i don't know elliot jack's work that well I do know criticisms of Elliot Jack's work. Right. And, and so the, the question, and, and Peter Jones may help on this as well. The, the questions come out about, um, I hate to say, is it fair? Uh, because the way that Jack's had originally set it up is in fact, the CEO has to be at a very high level. And then you have people who are capable of being janitors and not much more. And that's kind of a criticism of a, a hierarchical structure. Uh, Peter Jones, you, uh, can you comment on that? Well, how about just as an interlude? I think that it would be, what, would, what I'd like to actually see this conversation kind of evolve to is um, aspects of systems literacy that are at risk of being uh, overlooked. Sometimes when we focus, this is why I think the systems communities, the IEEE um, in particular, is, is good at um, developing well, it can be good at developing and maintaining legacies and keeping uh, the different, uh, different, um, you know, with a with what probably seems to other uh, sciences or other uh, knowledge practices, it might seem like there's an inordinate, almost like hero worship or focus on systems thinkers and kind of their special qualities or whatever. But I've come to think that, like with Elliot Jacks, for example there are unique bodies of knowledge and wisdom that have developed with, with different systems thinkers that didn't, that didn't spread very widely. They became kind of um, practices within a particular domain, like in the management domain. And, and compared to Peter Senge's um, you know, uh, reach within you know, the management, management field, as well as, you know, as well as some other, uh, as well as Acuff, of course, but Acuff was more kind of prominent in the 80s and Peter Senge in the 90s. The Elliot Jacks is there the whole time with the ideas of requisite organization, which are almost, you know, in some ways, like their, their principles and then somewhat formula, they may seem formulaic in that, that it is a systems theory, systems-based theory, but the idea of the requisite organization based on the um, appropriate levels of hierarchy, the appropriate selection for roles, and a very strong selection for roles, um, like a, the post, or the uh, text that I put in the chat. It's just kind of a, a pithy comment from from Elliot Jacks is that you know people who are criticizing the you know the you know the uh, the, the requisite hierarchical approach may never have worked in a large organization that really worked with its employees in a, in a very, you know, in a flourishing way. I have worked with several large companies that really did give me the opportunity to, to flourish and, and, and grow well in, I mean, AT&T and with AT&T Bell Labs in the 80s. Um, as a contractor, I worked with the Bell Labs AI group. I mean, I didn't need to rise in the hierarchy I was the, in the right role in the hierarchy and everything I wanted to do was possible for about three years. I've worked with other LexisNexis and uh, Elsevier Science in similar ways, large companies, just powerful ennobling kind of roles um, that small companies and, and lack of hierarchy actually don't necessarily give you that type of, that, that, that space with a lot of boundaries to accomplish uh, things. Large companies can do 
amazing things that smaller companies can't. So there is an experience of, there are positive experiences in working with appropriate requisite hierarchy that I think he's getting to. So there, so I know that's it's been out of fashion for a long time. I'm not against in principle, um, of course, the uh, decentralized organizations. I think they work very well for smaller companies where everyone has to do everything. Uh, but that isn't what Elliot Jacks was was working toward. And with requisite organization, it was in some ways, I see it anyway, as a kind of a, a pure requisite variety approach matching the hierarchy to the levels of control and communication from a, from a cybernetic perspective that are necessary to manage um, just you know the, the, the span that's within an organization. So they could be highly efficient but also extremely productive and effective at the same time and, and other forms of mixing and messing. And so he was very much a critic of, of messing with that. So it's, and if you look at nature, you know, and so look at Tim Allen's approach to complex ecology, you know, we don't have any problem with nature organizing itself with, with, with specialization, with roles and positions and niches and ecologies. But we have this thing about equality where we think that somehow the level of the hierarchy has something to do with better or worseness as a, you know, in social rank, you know, and that's, those are, those are things that, you know, that, that can be worked with within the organization, of course, but they aren't inherent to the, to the, the philosophy. So those are, you know, I think there's a lot of power in his work. It's very hard to understand. His book has like drawings in it and yet it is, it is dense. And so I'd re recommend it to people who are, who are training themselves in management theory or, you know, because you're not going to learn it at a school, probably. Elena, you you had a uh, comment on that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that Luc Kobaki, uh, who's a Belgian consultant and teacher, uh, wrote this book, Making Work Systems Work Better. And he combined Elliot Jacks, Stafford Beer, and Peter Checklin's work. In his, uh, in his consultancy practice. And I think one of the things that makes Elliot Jack's work make more sense to me, which I, is a story I heard about how it began, which I'd like, to, um, I'd like to have verified. But the story that I heard was that many women during the Second World War were drafted into factory jobs and they were pretty much all paid the same wage. It was wartime work and it needed to be done. But when the men came back, they wanted, uh, they wanted differential pay. And so Elliot Jacks was tasked with coming up with uh, criteria for why some people would be paid one wage and other people would be paid a higher wage. And he came up with this time span of control that basically said your wages would go up depending on how long it would take uh, for your work to be judged um, uh, okay or not. And so, <clears throat> you know, the person on the line, their work would be judged uh, okay or not within a minute. A four minute might be more like a day, but the people running the business and making the decisions about where to invest, uh, they would have a five year span. So I'd like to, to hear from somebody if that is an accurate story because it actually seems to make sense. He's certainly his work uh, started with looking at pay differentials. There's no, uh, I, I, I am aware of that. The, the relationship to the second world war on women I'm, I'm not personally aware of, but the, the work um, started with the Glacier Metal Company in England uh, with Wilfred Brown, and um, that was written up in the book at Explorations in Management. So um, it was about how to establish pay structures based on role and to have a number of criteria that go into making those determinations. So I think in essence, you're correct, uh, Elena, the specifics of women and so on, I'm, I'm not familiar, but it, it does have an element of ringing true, for sure, um, that, that could be helpful. 
Kelly has a yeah. comment. Kelly. Hi, I, I, I've been listening into this conversation and, and uh, I, I don't know if this, ho hopefully this will just contribute to the conversation. Um, I know that Peter Jones knows uh, uh, Kevin best and I don't know if there's other people that also know Kevin, but Kevin ha has been working on indigenous systems. And so, so, you know, so recently working with him in terms of his uh, um, integrated community development, um, cer certainly part of those overlooked uh, uh, contributors or participants um, mentioning spirits and, and, and th th then it certainly challenges me in terms of how uh, Canada reconciles when the, um, the ideas and notions of systems are completely different. I appreciate uh, uh, the, con uh, the comment in terms of verbs as opposed to nouns. Uh, that, that, that's somewhat helpful for me, but, but certainly when we go all the way to um, uh, active, activism that's been driven by spirits, it, it certainly challenges my Western thinking uh, and I didn't know if anybody had other comments or otherwise, but uh, it would, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it would be a, a typically overlooked participant. Well, I, I think it's, I just recently came across this, which was a book uh, called Low Tech Design Radical Indigen In Indigenism. And I'm sure. Peter Jones might be familiar with it. Um, but it's about really looking at the way indigenous people and traditional ecological knowledge has, of course, for thousands of years, known how very well to be, quote, systems literate, for want of a better way of expressing it. Um, and that uh, Western Westerners, <laughs> want of a better term, um, you know, dismissed it for many, many years um, as primitive, whereas in fact it was highly, is highly sophisticated. And the question is, is how do we bring it, how do we, how do we integrate, as you say? And I'm, I'm, uh, it's one reason I've just been tiptoeing or pitter pattering, as we were saying earlier on, into this whole field without making any assertions, because um, I'm totally conscious that I'm a product of my environment and how to, how to restore a balance in that way, you know, in, in our language and our thinking, but even around systems, you know, um, is, um, there's a great book called Native Science, which um, I like, which was written by um, a professor in New Mexico that really addresses this quite well. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, suggestions is all. It's the more the merrier. And that that is for me anyway. Uh, there, Kelly. So thanks for bring, bringing it up. I've written. If you've got a reference, um, please please put it down. I mean, what I what I'm really looking for is sort of recruiting people who want to help move this along. So um, I'm sort of re-energizing that uh, process. And I had a brief chat earlier on with Elena about that. Um, as I feel my way forward in this, because obviously it's delicate, right? To use a term. Um, um, <laughs> I mean, here am I, right? I'm sort of a 67 year old white male um, trying to talk about systems literacy. And, and um, anyway, uh, just gently, gently is the way I'm trying to go at this um, basically, but maybe not, maybe we should be more assertive. I don't know. I have a, a Building on that, um, I'm curious if anyone on this call has um, knows an indigenous language or has attempted to learn a language, and and I wonder how primary that could be toward understanding um, indigenous worldviews and and systems thinking. Yeah, I haven't. I'll I'll, I'll take a different slack, a different slant that when you talk indigenous because the Chinese civilization is very old. Yes. And so we've actually in the system changes uh, program, we, we, we are using 
uh, traditional Chinese medicine as a foundation, which takes a lot of untangling. But one of the interesting things that uh, when I brought it up, and this has been a couple of years ago that I brought it to the team, it, we, when I brought it in, it was like, wow, we can't really do that with the audiences we've got. It's too big a leap. And so finding a way to frame it so that um, people don't reject it. So, so it's, it's kind of like, so, you know, I, I admit that, you know, I've, I've been using a Chinese doctor for about 30 years um, and he's trained in Western and, and in Chinese medicine. And so it's really great, but my wife doesn't believe in it. Um, just never believed in it. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate that, uh, that I may be in the minority when I'm saying, oh, let's bring an alternative way um, and you know how does that add on? Well, I don't. I you know I don't. I mean, obviously, one of our participants in the IWS is Thomas Wong, who's in Hong Kong, and he's a Chinese. Uh, he's a he. He was formerly a systems engineer and became a, um, a Chinese medicine um, um, healer, or however you like to describe. And I have long loved acupuncture. I mean, I go to an acupuncturist um, on a sort of almost a seasonal basis. And um, I think the whole question of energy is uh, something that we need to bring into this conversation. Mick had a comment. Mick, are you gonna uh, come back? Yeah, no, I, I, I would just, uh, spirit was mentioned and I, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't just check in and, you know, I, lots of books. Um, I'm thinking uh, particularly of uh, Capra and uh, Luisi, I think. Yeah. Go, they go into uh, quite a bit of de detail about a uh, broader um, and more holistic interpretation of the word spirit as the breath of life that uh, that runs through living systems. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've just, I've been meditated a lot on that word and, uh, you know, I, so in, sometimes when I when I look at these sort of issues of language um, and how we can reinterpret uh, and learn just through meditating on language, you know, I, I can feel my brain just rewiring um, and discovering new ways of, of considering and thinking. Anyway, it was just kind of a tangential comment. No, that's good. Yeah. Thanks. Dean had a question, comment. Yeah, I was more sort of going to make a comment and in keeping with this strain of conversation, another resource that uh, people might find useful. I'm not sure if people are familiar with John Burroughs, who's a law prof at University of Victoria. He's from uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation up on the Bruce Peninsula originally. And uh, I literally was uh, in a, a different webinar on uh, Canadian climate law uh, just in the last week. And John gave a talk there. And, He's pretty well known and written a lot about uh, uh, indigenous languages. And uh, he actually spoke explicitly about the theme we're talking about tonight, about uh, being verb based, et cetera. Um, it's one of, the, one of the leading thinkers in Canada about how to, how to think about indigenous legal traditions and indigenous governance and uh, how to rationalize that or not with the Canadian legal system and Canadian governance. Uh, so if people aren't familiar with him as a resource, John Burroughs at University of Victoria, I, I don't know whether you would call what he does systems thinking. I'm not sure whether that's the kind of language that, that, that John would use, but um, an interesting guy and certainly very relevant to this, uh, this little stream of conversation. I thought I would Thanks. throw it in. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Peter Jones has been typing away here. What have you been typing, Peter? <laughs> oh, I just continued to put in a couple of uh, side references. It's a good way to, to share. So, so I was yeah. taught, I had added about um, it's something that, um, this is something that actually, since Kelly brought up Kevin Best, that Kevin had, um, Act, um, Kevin had some activism around preserving that um, that we were engaged in, in prevent in um, in trying to trying to uh, conserve the Black Oak Savanna and the health of High Park from uh, over construction in Bloor West Village, and so we we were able 
you know, Kevin and, and us as allies brought together a pretty large group to public hearings, including a number of indigenous people, public hearings around um, limits on construction and the height of the, the height of um, new buildings that would be just north up the hill from High Park because they would have extensively deep, um, um, uh, you know, they would be digging uh, probably to the point of the aquifer or the water flow, flow from, um, from the Humber watershed overall down through High Park. And so High Park is one of the last uh, remaining areas of Black Oak Savanna um, in Southern Ontario that used to extend all the way down through the Appalachians. And so these were basically cultivated hunting ecosystems and they were, and so they would, you know, raise certain types of acorns that would attract the deer that would make hunting easily, easy and it was a give and take, you know, for kind of co-created with nature. And so this is one of those occasions that kind of helped that Kelly was was pointing to in the way that um, indigenous activism can be, it isn't just about the land in general, it's about the dynamics of a particular relationship. And I might not address every single development for sure, but in things that are going to, you know, that, that are going to have some um, impact on, on, um, on sacred spaces or on known, known concerns with land and the water flow. That was a couple of years ago. Yeah, Daisy has a hand up. Yeah, Daisy, go ahead. Hi, um, uh, it was just um, a, another comment because I'm not sure if it's relevant or not. I was um, at a virtual uh, big data and AI uh, conference last um, September and there was a group uh, from the government of Canada and we're working with some indigenous communities to develop language leaders and to, to preserve and teach um, some of the languages with the Rami, um, some elders. And uh, they were talking about like exactly kind of what you're talking about here, the complexity, et cetera. Um, and then just the balance of uh, the, the developers <laughs> trying to use their logic and their ways of perceiving it versus how the language works and working together on those projects. And if I can find the reference, I'll, I'll send it to you. But it sounds like similar to kind of what you're talking about in terms of um, that delicate balance of uh, wanting to preserve because knowing that there's just so much richness in what is being offered, but <laughs> kind of how do you bring it to the present world and uh, keep it alive kind of thing. So that's all I have to say. Peter? Yeah, um, I, I think this idea of language, I mean, it is, is crucial. How do we, how do we address that? How do we, how do we move forward with it? Um, I, I, I think it'd be, it's, a, it's something to bring into the, into the mix here in, in some, in some way. Um, uh, Good. So I, I think we'll wrap the session. Um, but Peter, I'll give you the opportunity now to invite people to the uh, the pub that you've got and uh, and how they find out more about it and uh, what usually happens there. Yeah, let me. Um, well, I, I started having just an open kind of pub evening. Well, not really. A, I mean, it, I'm calling it a pub because it's a public space for conversation. And I started with the IS in December, but of course that's very just closed to IS. Um, so the College of Exploration, um, I, I am working a lot in coastal areas and ocean topics, um, and I wanted to start bringing together folks involved in the environment uh, or involved with ocean and earth literacies with uh, all colleagues in the systems arena. Um, who like this, that is sort of to bring more, um, to increase the variety. So yes, uh, once a month on a first Friday uh, from three to six, uh, it's really a big open space with um, maybe 10 breakout rooms with different titles. And just as you might wander into a pub and 
find yourself sitting down to an interesting person and by randomness, um, that's the purpose. Uh, and um, it's a way of making connections and looking at ways to cross uh, boundaries. And I think David put a, a link in the email um, to that pub and I can, I can quickly uh, do that again for the, in the chat here um, because I created a page when David um, uh, um, suggested that this was an important, you know, it's a good, it's a good place to, to, um, to meet other people basically in a, in a bit like we've done here when new people come in, but it's not, it, there's no, I don't have any presentation um, format. It's a, a totally, um, a totally open possibility for three hours and uh, just requires a registration for the zoom link and then i'll send out the reminder you know that you registered if you would wish to 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 join in so we could have um, you know be more than welcome any of you or all of you to to turn up and and see and particularly you know it came to some extent out of the covid sort of frustrations of being stuck at home and not being able to go to real pubs so um, anyway, thanks, Peter, for your contribution and great to see you again. Thanks, got to go, see you. Yep. Okay, so I think we'll close the session out um, and uh, people who are interested in continuing the conversation, um, you can find Peter. I did put a link in the, it's actually on the System Thinking Ontario page and so you can follow up and uh, can see more of you. Me um, too, yeah. yeah. And uh, for the next uh, couple of System Thinking Ontarios, um, I'm working on stuff. Uh, we will have them. Uh, I'm still negotiating through some ordering, but um, keep tuned, keep, keep in touch, and uh, we'll see you the next time. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.